What are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? Trying to get on the Slice Out Radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's all right. Oh. You may have it. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. The opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or Lifestyle Radio. You know I blame it on. Education and politicians, no one's willing to step up and speak. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Pace Radio Show. My name's Al Graham, and we are coming to you live here at LifestyleRadio.net, as well as we heard uh, live on Spreaker. Uh, tonight, to my joint host is Debbie Stoltz Giffen, and she has lined up a guest who is a patient. And she's here to tell her story on how cannabis help, has helped her, let us, plus let us know how um, she's educating others. And, but before we learn more, it's time for Deb and I to have a quick chat. Well, Deb, how's things? Not bad, Al. Um, sitting here in a little bit of a snowstorm in Nova Scotia, but certainly nothing unusual for March. <laughs> That's right. I, I watch your little section over there get battered often. You know, like well, and knock on wood, and that would be my head. I mean, it it really hasn't been a typically rough winter yeah. in Nova Scotia, and it's the middle of March, and I probably shouldn't have said that, but you know, yeah, yeah, we're, we're snowless, we're snowless here, so no snow for igloos. I can tell you that. Sure. All right, Deb. Uh, our news, I guess we're just going to sort of generalize on uh, some of the things that have been happening across the, uh, I guess the country, you could say, uh, and especially a lot in the last 24, 48 hours. And uh, that's more of those raids. Oh, it's un- unreal, Al. It seems that, that nary a day goes by lately. It seems that I don't pull up social media and, and I'm reading <laughs> about a, a raid on a dispensary somewhere in this country and oftentimes it's more than one on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, uh, yesterday, the news, city of St. John, there on, were uh, some of the four of the dispensaries that had been raided uh, in January, I believe, that were raided again. It just seems like clockwork. They're going in and shutting them down. Yeah, I read something that uh, some of them had only been reopened for like a week or even less. Well, yes, and ironically in in Nova Scotia we're seeing uh, somewhat of a different scenario. All of the dispensaries that are bona fide 100% medical in their operating procedures are being left alone. The cops are stopping in, checking on them and and, uh, going away again and basically reassuring them that if they follow that path that they won't be raided by by the cops and that's because the place is is making sure that uh, you know contacting the doctor to verify the condition doing all the due diligence exactly yeah, 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 and I think that's. And, sort of- I, and I do, I do know that a, a number of the <clears throat> ones in Saint John, I certainly can't vouch for them all, but but some of them are following that very similar procedure to a T. Yeah, um, in Toronto, I know, like, uh, well, today there was more cannabis culture rates. There, and I saw that as well. Yeah. Uh, as far as dispensary wise, the, you know, the dispensaries are still being uh, raided. And there's um, uh, but there's also places, like you say, though that I know have been there for many years, and they run under certain criteria, uh, right to the T. And uh, they've been running all this time, and they've, they've seemed so far to be left alone. I'd be curious to know how much money has been spent by all of these raids, uh, on behalf of the federal government, I'm sure the amount is astronomical and, and would go a long ways to help address the fentanyl crisis, help yeah. out with, with health care, 
all kinds this of things. Is, yeah, and the municipal end of it all is being also, you know, is funding this as well because of the cities being involved in raiding all the dispensaries. Well, definitely, and it, I mean, it has to be taking a, a toll on the financial resources at every corner, mm -hmm. and and in these days of of uh, cutbacks, it just doesn't seem to be a very prudent practice to be following. Uh, it's been a year and a half since since the election where we were promised legalization mm -hmm. and. And certainly by now, I think we should be seeing some moves in a more positive direction than, than what we're seeing. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see some moves here very, very shortly because, uh, yeah, it's getting pretty heated out there, that's for sure. It's it's very intense times and, and interesting. Uh, uh, the uh, the budget was released today, and apparently they've set aside ten million in funding over five years to support marijuana public education programming and surveillance activities. Oh, and surveillance activities. That sounds like more money towards the police. Well, it does, doesn't it? And I thought that moving toward legalization, like my vision of moving toward legalization, would have been one in which. Less money, yeah. not more, well, was being put into law enforcement. Yeah, and as I, as we're aware, Bill Blair just did that tour across uh, Canada, visiting the police stations, as well as the municipalities and stuff. So I'm sure the money discussion came up. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. 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 Apparently, uh, the budget also noted that there were plans to ensure taxation levels of cannabis remain sustainable over time. Um, apparently the government has repeatedly stated that they don't want to set tax rates on cannabis too high to give legal cannabis a chance to come out of the hands of the black market. Yeah, because obviously they overtax it. And we'll be able to talk to our guests here tonight about taxes where she's at. But the, uh, oh, no doubt. Uh, the, yeah, because if they overprice their product, uh, the black market will just keep right on going. I haven't, I haven't really heard anything yet in the legalization conversation uh, that indicates to me that they're going to be able to successfully remove it from the black market. Yeah, I don't think they're going to. I don't think they'll ever. It's the same as uh, alcohol. You know, there's still bootleggers out there, right? Definitely. Yeah. Even, uh, okay. even with the capability to home brew. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it, it'll never, ever be eliminated, but it would be, obviously, it'd be reduced, I would think. But, you know, we'll see what happens. And if they overprice the product, then they, and that was mentioned in that task force report that they realize that they can't overprice the stuff. And, you know, if they all of a sudden come out with $15, $20 grams, and you can go down the street and pick it up for 10 bucks. For sure. Yeah. I mean, even if even if they charge ten dollars for it, you'll yeah. probably be able to go down the street and buy it for five. So that's right. Really, really look at that hard. Yeah. Oh, big time, big time. Well, I know we had here in Ontario, we had a problem years back with the tobacco in, where the taxes got so high in it that um, they were there was so much of the smuggling of tobacco was happening, whether it was through the reserves or or, you know, being stuff brought across the border that the government was forced to lower the taxes on tobacco? Yeah, the the, uh, the black market's always waiting if the cost goes too high on a that's substance, right. that's for sure. That's right. Okay, well, let's move on to our guest. And so uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome our cannabis patient and advocate friend, uh, Janice Patton, to the Pace Radio Show. How are you, Janice? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, we really appreciate you uh, coming on to the show and talking to uh, our listeners about um, but what you've been doing, you know, as a advocate, uh, your, your story, so on and so forth. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to start out by saying that I shared the same dream um, as um, the young lady on the show with us did. 
I share the same dream of federal legalization, that it would actually be smooth and the patients would be able to get access to the medicine they needed without the restrictions. But as time goes on, I'm realizing that I'm actually frightened to use the phrase federally legal because of the things that go along with that, that is giving control to the government and we, you know, in past, looking back in past things they've had control of, like tobacco and alcohol, a lot of the times that has not turned out well. And that does frighten me, being someone that is completely dependent on cannabis every day to actually maintain a status of life. Um, I am a patient that has a rare brain disease. It's called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And um, what that is, is my body is no longer absorbing excess spinal fluid that my body's also producing more of. And so that fluid builds up on my brain. And then um, the only way to, to get that fluid down would be have numerous spinal taps, which I have had to have. And um, also to be on a medication that um, causes your kidneys to shut down, which is exactly what happened to me. Yes. And then when you get to that point, then you have brain surgery. Wow. Um, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> lot, lots there for us to cover throughout the show. What we're going to do here is I'm going to hand some questions over to Deb. And when you mentioned the um, legalization in state-wise, um, we should tell our listeners, uh, normally our, our guests are from Canada. And you're in the U.S., right? Yes, I am. I'm actually in the great state of Oregon which it is actually legal in this state, but we are actually kind of fighting right now to keep our medical legal here, to, to keep our medical program going, because it, it seems like they're trying to possibly put so many regulations and restrictions on us here and possibly try to do away with our medical program. So we're trying to fight to keep that going. That sort of sounds somewhat similar for us too, Deb, where the government is in the process of deciding whether to have one program or two? Well, very, very much so. Yeah, that's Definitely. part of that. Yeah, yeah. So what sort of things are you seeing, Janice, as, as the uh, state government is is moving in this direction as far as regulations go? Well, one of the things that we saw early on um, was growers that normally were um, kind of like these average Joes that, that were growers for years that did so much for their patients were having to drop their patients because they couldn't conform to a lot of the restrictions that were given and to get the licensing and stuff, it's very expensive. And so they were having to drop patients. So we saw a lot of patients going without their meds and without the medicine that they need. And that can be dangerous, especially for someone like I said, it's a large quantity consumer of like cannabis oil that can be dangerous. Yes. Oh, for sure. Um, how is it set up now for, for growers to be able to grow for patients in the state of Oregon? In the state of Oregon, you have to have a grower's license. That is something you have to apply for. That is a $4,000 license. And um, you do have to track everything from the moment that it's a seed until it's ready to, to be given to the patient. So it's very tedious book work. Um, it can be overwhelming for a lot of these people that weren't normally having to deal with that. They just, they know how to grow the medicine, but they don't know how to do a lot of the things and they didn't have the $4,000 to get that license. So that can be a little restrictive. I mean, I understand why they're doing it to try to keep track, but some of the things that, that they're trying to keep track, it, it might be just a little too extensive. So I'm hoping they will equal that out somewhere soon. Wow. Four grand. Wow. I know. I'm yeah, still that's, picking my chin up is, off of my desk no, no, here. Now, this is for somebody to be able to grow for another patient, sir, like a designated grower? Yes. Now, okay, we have a designated growers uh, program with, within our medical program here in Canada. Uh, now, Deb, with the ACMPR, did they include all that where you basically got to keep track of everything from seed to harvest? I 
don't recall, Al. Yeah, I know there's some documentation that they have to keep track of, but I don't know if this is in depth as uh, I'm, I'm being told, no. But I don't think it would be as in depth as what uh, Janice is down there in Oregon that they have to go through. Wow. And four grand. Now, how that's crazy, too. And now, how do they determine the number of plants that a patient would be able to have? Um, that is absolutely a number that they've come up with on their own without really doing the research or the back the backstory that they needed to really to assign how many plants per patient. So that's numbers that they came up with. Okay, whereas ours here is uh, you and your doctor decide how many grams you get, and then the, there's a government formula. And if you're growing inside, so if you're growing inside, you get uh, five plants for every gram. So if you're prescribed five grams a day, you get 25 plants inside. Oh, wow. That's really different. Yeah, here it um, goes by how much your grower is wants to give you. Most of the time here, it's one, one ounce per month is like the average going rate. Um, but there's no wow. doctor that assigns how much you're given. Wow. So that's really different. Yeah, yeah. Dad, yeah, what would you think about having a program like that? I think that it sounds like possibly patients might get more medicine if they did it your way. I mean, if, if a doctor held the grower to be more accountable for how much they need to give, I think that it might be more, it might be fair, a little bit more fair of, a, of an exchange there. Well, I don't know, you could probably, because Deb, how many, how many patients do you know, just to sort of offhand, that would have like, 10, 20 grams a day. So it'd be like 100 plants. Quite a few. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I myself, I, 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 take, I take two grams of cannabis oil or Rick Simpson oil. I take two grams a day. It takes about three and a half pounds a month for all my medicine that I take. Well, I see I, I, the picture I used to um, promote the show for tonight. Uh, you look like you're in uh, quite the garden. Yeah, it is. It's a really nice garden, and that's that's actually a garden at Mountain Valley Farms in Oregon City, Oregon. And the gentleman that grows there, David Goster, he he's a totally organic grower. That just he's old school, back to fish guts. And I mean, he's he's very anal about how clean and efficient the plants are taken care of. And the ones that are in that picture are actually a Charlotte's Web strain, but he calls them the grannies because he, he sort of named them after me because. I help take care of them, but they're a high CBD strain and they're beautiful plants and they're going to be going to some children that need it. Nice. 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 So with your grower, how many patients is he able to grow for Janice? Um, that's a tricky question. Um, but he, I believe they changed it up so much I'm, and me not being a grower, but I'm, I think that you can, have 24 plants and it's six per per person that'd be four people okay if i'm not mistaken i could be wrong on that but every yes. for every patient is allowed you're allowed to grow six plants per patient okay and, if and it's that in the in the state of oregon everyone over 21 can grow four plants per household Okay, and do, is there any licensing involved with that privilege? No, there's not, which is really nice. Everybody here can grow four plants without having to keep track of it. But you're yeah, not allowed to sell it or give it away or do anything. It's just for your own personal yeah. use, which is wonderful. Can you have all four of those plants in bloom at the same time, or are you restricted to two and two? No, they can all four be in bloom. Okay. All right. I've seen some of some information that some of the states only allow, let's say they allow six plants, but only three of them are allowed to be uh, in bloom. Yeah. Yeah. It can be Just tricky. And I, I noticed looking over different states, it's different everywhere. Go ahead, Deb. Well, actually, in, in Canada, Al, I don't know if um, you were involved with the program when it was the Section 56 days. No, no. I've had um, an exemption from the federal government since 2000. 
Yeah, that's before the program, before the MAMAR. In, in the very beginning, I was allowed seven plants uh, for one and a half grams a day. But, but I was only allowed to have three mature plants and four immature plants. There you go. And it was then uh, only either seven plants or 11 plants per patient. And I don't have a clue where the cutoff line was of who got to have seven and who got to have 11. But, I mean, at that time they were rumoring that applications were being processed by the health minister throwing them downstairs and whoever's landed down at the bottom of the stairs first got processed. It was It was... So arbitrary. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 Boy, it's, the program's changed over the years. Then. Hugely. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Thanks to uh, Terry Parker. Yeah. Yeah. And the battles before the courts. Um, down there with your medical program, was it something that you had to take to the courts, Janice, in order to get, or the government just um, bring it in? Um, you know, they did a lot of fighting to get it brought in. Um, we did have to vote it in, but I'll tell you, since it's been in, we've had to fight basically to do anything here, to have our hemp stock or any of our little festivals we want to do, we've had to kind of fight. Um, I know they're still fighting pretty hard in Eastern Oregon. Um, the whole country's kind of getting used to the idea that cannabis is medicine, and I, I believe that it's starting to swing that way finally. Um, it's just the understanding of it. That's that's kind of why I reached out to kind of be on your show, but I wanted to let everybody know the importance of the plant. A lot of people with the recreational thing getting so big, they're, um, they're for, you know, they're kind of overlooking the fact that it is, it is a really good medical um, property in the plant and that that is something that we should be studying and using some of the money that they're making to be uh, doing studies and things like that. Well, certainly the money could, could uh, headed in that direction would be putting it to good use to further the uh, implementation of cannabis as medicine for folks who desperately need it. Yeah. That's, that's where I'm at with it too. It's, I live in a state, in the state of Oregon, you are allowed to go to your doctor and if you're, you know, really, really sick, you're dying, you can ask the doctor to give you a pill to take, that you take home and you take the pill and you end your life. But I am not allowed to go to my doctor and ask her to write me a prescription for cannabis oil, which is something I need to keep down my spinal pressure so I don't have a seizure and die. And I'm not allowed to ask her for that. I have to go and pay extra money to go to a clinic that that does write those prescriptions. So it's kind of a it's kind of a it's kind of a weird situation when you look at it like that. Yeah. Well, really. So so in Oregon, you actually have to go to a clinic. You can't go to your family physician. Yeah, most family physicians here cannot prescribe it to you because they're under contract with uh, bigger companies that, you know, they can be penalized, they can get in trouble for, for um, giving you the card. My doctor still, knowing that it works for me, and has for three years, she knows that's the only thing that I've changed that is actually working, and she still cannot really talk to me about it. I have to go and talk to a weed doctor when I have issues. So, and I, that costs $120 every time I do that. And my insurance doesn't cover that. Oh, wow. wow. So, so how often would you have to go to a clinic to see a doctor to maintain well, your, your state permission to be able to use cannabis? It's once a year. Okay. I have to go and I have to pay the money. But, and I'm on disability, so, you know, coming up with money to pay for that yeah. plus you know, the amount that they want usually for your grower. Luckily, now they're having the grower pay the grower's cost, but before you'd have to come up with that cost as well. So it can get spendy, and it, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, they know by proof of my records that 
I have to have this oil because three days without it, and I'm hospitalized, and I'm getting one of those painful spinal taps that we talked about. And or I could have a seizure and die from that. So, and it only takes three days, three times, two times I've run out of the oil, both times it was three days. So, and my doctors all know this, but yet they can't support it. And to me that, that's, it, I don't know, it just, it just rings a little bit inhumane to me, you know? It sounds like, it sounds like your doctors or the doctor's hands are tied behind the backs by corporate corporations, companies. Exactly what it is. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Like we and have I, doctors I, just, like I find that terrible. Um, I know down where, where Deb is in Nova Scotia and I'm here in Ontario, like we've got signing clinics, which would be sounds like they're similar to, to yours, Santa's, uh, because we have doctors that won't sign as well, but they charge some of them are, some of them are free and some of them are like 300 bucks, some are, or less. I don't know what you like down on your end, Deb. Well, some, some of the clinics, uh, charge according to the amount that the doctor is willing to prescribe so that if you want a, a higher amount uh, than say the three to five grams that Health Canada recommend as being the norm uh, wherever they got that from uh, that if it's more than that the, the signing physician expects a, a larger piece of the pie and, and as the number increases the fee that they charge increases exponentially. Wow. We have some, we have some clinics that uh, will sign for patients for a fee uh, in the ballpark of $250, I believe. But then, because our system is so different, Janice, at that point, they won't give you the paper that they've signed, which is basically your prescription, they send it off to what we have here in, in Canada that are known as licensed producers, which are corporations that produce the medicine but, but sell it at uh, overly inflated prices. And sometimes the quality leaves a lot to be desired as well. Wow. Where patients, patients in Canada can, by law, uh, or by regulation, I can, by law, uh, or, or by regulation, someone I guess, to grow it's it for law. us. Correct. We can grow yeah, and correct. how many but plants are you allowed to grow at a time? Yeah, and correct. how many but plants are you allowed to grow at a time? It depends on the prescription amount that you and your doctor agree upon. Ah, uh, yeah. wow. So... so Mine is for 12 grams a day, and I have someone designated to grow it for me who's allowed to have 59 plants on my behalf. Because so you're, he's roughly. giving you 12 grams a day? Yes. Yeah. And that's, wow. That'd be, 50, that'd be 59 plants in total. That's your veg, your bloom. Yes. Yeah. Cuttings. Yeah. That's inside. The numbers change if if they're being grown outside. outside. You're allowed less plants where you're not limited to a confined plant. space. Yeah, wow, yeah, I think that, that would work out way better as as a, as getting prescribed here for us if they did it that way. And we got storage. This is how too. it sounds to me. Yes, people that uh, have inside grows, their own uh, indoor garden are allowed to store, I believe it's roughly the equivalent of an eight-month supply. Wow. Account for crop failures and infestations and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I talked to one patient, they were at 20 grams a day, and it was like, they were allowed pounds, pounds, it was like 10 pounds or Eight pounds of storage. Wow, that, that is a no. great program you guys are working with there. <laughs> I mean, wow. seriously, here are the patients here are lucky to get an ounce a month. Really? Wow. Yeah. Lots of, pati lots of patients <laughs> here who have that as a pres daily prescription. Wow. Yeah, you, that's... 
we should take some lessons at least from that from you guys. That's 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 extensively better. I mean, I could I could probably not have to get crazy and and have two and three people growing for me at once to get my medicine if I could get something like that. Yeah, and, and there's also no attached fee for someone who offers to be your designated grower. When that paperwork is submitted to our federal government for, for their approval, and if all your I's are, are dotted and T's are crossed, it, it will go through. There's no fee whatsoever that's uh, expected to be paid yeah. by anyone. Just a criminal check. Wow. A criminal record check. Yeah. Yes, just for a criminal record yeah, check. And that's it. Yeah. Okay, ladies, it's break time. Time to pay some bills. Uh, tonight, our music, uh, like our guest, is uh, from the south of our border, down in the U.S. So tonight, our music is from down there as well. And we're going to listen to some Chief Green Bud. And we'll be playing uh, part of a song called A Friend with Weed is a Friend Indeed. When we return, Deb and I will continue our talk with Janice. This is the Pace Radio Show here at LifestyleRadio.net. Talk with Janice. This is the Pace Radio Show here at LifestyleRadio.net. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. There are times when the whole damn town is dry And the stash you saved for summer didn't make it to July I know it feels like forever till the harvests of September So if you need to catch a buzz, you're welcome anytime Canada, the time to act is now. These days, your customers are seeking variety. Increase your earning potential by expanding your inventory with CC Nexus, Canada's largest cannabis seed wholesaler. CC Nexus stocks over 60 reputable breeders, including Canuck seeds, with a wealth of auto flower, regular, feminized, and CBD strains. All first time customers will receive a free pack of Canuck seeds plus a mug, t-shirt, and additional promotional materials. Add strains and increase your profit with CC Nexus, your Canadian-owned and operated wholesaler of cannabis seeds. Discreet, worldwide stealth shipping from Canada, supporting you locally. Call today, 1-844-843-7995, 1-844-843-7995, or visit us at ccnexus.global. The following is a public service announcement from the Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners Society. The Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners Society is a non-profit organization dedicated to ensuring improved access to therapeutic cannabis and cannabis byproducts in Canada. With a federal government that has committed to legalizing cannabis, we feel it is our duty to ensure that the medicinal use of cannabis doesn't get lost in the process and that there are clear distinctions made between the medicinal and recreational use of cannabis. It is our mission to ensure that government regulation doesn't get in the way of a sick disabled or terminally ill person's right to use or produce this amazing natural health product. If you would like to get involved, you can contact us on the internet www.canadiantherapeuticcannabispartners.com on Facebook, CTCP Society or search Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners CTCP now operates a medicinal cannabis signing clinic if you want to grow your own medicinal cannabis and are located anywhere in Canada then I'd like to suggest that you give them a call they can be reached at 1-613-967-9888 that's one six one three nine six seven nine eight 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 and grow on with CTCP. Man, have you been to Canada's yet? Canada's. Campbellford's premier cannabis culture shop at 19 Bridge Street West. They've got bongs, oil rigs, grinders, and papers. Everything you need for consumption. They've got seeds, soil, nutrients, and dome trays too. Everything you need for cultivation. Get top quality seeds from top suppliers like Canuck, Crop King, and wholesaler Nexus. Canada's. They've got all kinds of awesome cannabis novelties, clothing, and apparel. I know, right? It's a lot more than just a bong shop. Interested in gaining legal access? Canada's can help. 
They're a PACE information center. You know, people advocating cannabis education? Come by the shop and check it out. 19 Bridge Street West, Campbellford. Canadays. Have your say without saying a word. Canadays.ca. Growing your own vegetables, flowers, or even medicinal plants can be a challenge without the right equipment and proper know-how. At BMA Hydroponics, not only are they your urban horticultural experts and suppliers, but their staff holds the customer's needs paramount to making a sale. Family-owned with decades of experience and knowledge, they offer free advice in person by phone or email. BMA Hydroponics wants to ensure you have the advice you need, which is why you'll find tips and tricks on different ways to grow, like wick, ebb and flow, drip, or aeroponic system, as well as other helpful links at bmahydroponics.com. If you can't find what you're looking for, just let them know, and they'll do everything they can to get what you're looking for. At BMA Hydroponics, each staff member also possesses a federal exempt MMAR license, making their strong suit, empathy, experience, and dedication to their customers. Because when you know how to grow, you'll have results that make you proud. BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. Visit bmahydroponics.com. BMA offers cannabinoid testing. So if you want to prove you've got good medicine, head to BMA Hydroponics and prove it. You don't have to scrape your bowl. Smoke on stems and seeds. I'll share my sack. I've got your back. You do the same for me. Don't you agree? That a friend with weed is a friend in For about four minutes, Janice, and we can talk. Okay. Hey, we're back, okay. and we are live well, here at LifestyleRadio.net, and we can also be found at other audio locations such as TuneIn Radio and Shoutcast. We're there. We're live there as well. Uh, don't forget to catch the 420 Radio Show this Friday and every Friday night at 7 p.m. for two hours of conversation with Al, Marcel, Ross, and Chris, along with some fantastic guests and some great music. Tonight on our program here at the Pace Radio Show, I'm joined by our guest, cannabis patient and advocate Janice Patton, plus my super joint host, Debbie Stoltz Gifton of the Maritimers United for Medical Marijuana. Deb, Janice, uh, first segment of the show, we were talking about, actually, we're comparing the two medical programs between the two countries uh, because uh, Janice is uh, in Oregon. Uh, I think maybe Deb, we're gonna take a different direction this this um, session. In just a second. All right. I had one more one more quick question because I'm still thinking about that four thousand dollars. It's kind of <laughs> blowing my mind. Um, <laughs> I no, I don't always focus on money, but it, it just seems like such a a huge fee, and I'm wondering if anything special comes with that or there does it involve in inspections or anything other than a certificate to perhaps hang on the door to keep law enforcement at bay well it does give you the right to go to a dispensary and sell the um, product which is the big thing I guess Um, but you know basically that is what it is just kind of it's kind of like an insurance that you'll be, you know, that you're complying with what they want you to comply with. Um, the other two licenses that go with it are $4,000 a piece as well, which though that's for recreational, that's for processing and um, uh, producing. So if you wanted to make oils or any kind of like concentrates, you'd also have to have a special license for that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah not so they're, they're making some money. Um, but I think what we're going to try to do uh, here, well, at least what, what I'm trying to get put together, is um, to go down and let the lawmakers know that they are making quite a bit of money, and we appreciate that they're putting a lot of that money into schools and the police fund. But we'd also like some of that money to be put into research and maybe some medical facilities opened that are actually doing research on serious illnesses with cannabis. So that's something that I'm hoping that um, maybe in the future. Great they, idea. Yeah, uh, yeah. I know we haven't gotten away from these differences in the programs things, but I, I know the in our task force recommendations they talk about taxing 
legal cannabis and medical cannabis the same? Are you guys under anything like that? Is your medical cannabis taxed at a dispensary, a medical dispensary? Right now, no. Right now, if you have a medical card, you are not taxed. For recreational, there is the tax, and it's a it's a nice size tax. But yeah, there is there is that difference, which is nice that they've kept it that way for us. You want to mention the where it is your percentage of tax for your recreation? Um. Wow. I mm, uh, I can't remember uh, right off. They've changed it a couple times, so okay. I really don't know because I don't really keep up with the recreational side of it. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, Dad. Back over to you. Well, it's nice to hear that there's no tax being charged on the medical end of things because to me it's it's certainly a a brainless move to charge people tax on their medicine. Yeah, I agree. I I was really uh, happy to hear that they were not going to do that. And once again, we're trying to, you know, work with them. We, you know, constantly have a team of people going down there and talking to them and and you know, just reassuring them and letting them know that, hey, we're here to answer your questions, but please don't start um, just getting crazy and and putting major restrictions and things. We're just trying to work with our lawmakers here to try to get things uh, to run as smoothly as possible. And I feel like out of the states that, that first have had it legal, like Colorado and Washington, I feel like Oregon has stuck um, by its medical program, the best so far. Well, that must be encouraging for you, at least. Yeah, it is. I'm, I mean, I would hate to have to, you know, move my whole family to a different state because, you know, they started putting so much restrictions. It was hard for me to get the amount of medicine that I need. I mean, there are a lot of people, and, and you know, most probably most of your listeners may not realize that there are a lot of people in this world that are totally dependent on cannabis, that that is the only thing that is known to man that works for their illness. And for um, governments to be putting taxes and things on medicine that keeps a person alive is, I mean, you know, that's not good. <laughs> well, it, it's unconscionable, really. It's, it's Yeah, I mean, it's, and, and it's, Where's the humanity, you know? Definitely. Um, you you mentioned getting ready to lobby your state legislature. Is that something that you've been working at for a while now? Yeah, you know, there's there's quite a few really good lobbyists that I know personally. And, yeah, that's that is something that I'm myself would like to see happen. Um, one of the things that I have spoken to one of the representatives here, her name's Ann Lineger. I had a personal meeting with her and I asked her if there could, you know, if they're going to limit how much you can have, would they please um, remember that there are patients like me that have, that use a large quantity of cannabis and could they at least make a special, um, some type of special a allowance for the growers that grow for these patients to grow more. So that is something that I did put forth. I have not, of course, they haven't voted or done anything with it. But, you know, it's little things like that that we're trying to incur just, just to keep it where people aren't losing their lives, at least in our state. Do you, do you feel as if the politicians you've spoken with are receptive and understand that concept? I feel like not very many of them are. Um, I think the more that we educate them and go to meetings and go to like personal uh, uh, to um, where they they have the public hearings and things like that, where we're allowed to speak. I think the more that we go and attend these things and share our stories and educate people, and people start to vote in the way that's in you know more pro cannabis. I think they will be more receptive to that. But as of right now, I think it's maybe like 20% on our side, 80% on the side of making money. Making money. That sounds about like Canada probably, I'd be guessing, with the with the licensed producer system that, that we talked about in the first segment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, 
a lot of the politicians, I think, struggle with the fact that there are patients who need to grow their own and, and, uh, when they feel that often that the licensed producer route is is the way that we should all be going, don't you think, Al? Yeah, that's what uh, that's what um, the consensus feels like. You know, they don't want. They, they well, you can look at the MMPR. That's when that program kicked in. They they yanked away our grow rights, or they attempted to yank away our grow rights from the ones who are already growing. And they made everybody new go to the corporations and uh, patients battled that in court and won the right to grow, to continue to grow. And we still grow. And it's, you know, uh, to have, like for myself, to be able to give uh, a patient the option, you know, grow for yourself, have somebody grow for you. Or if you don't know of anybody grow for you and you're not physically capable of growing for yourself, there is that third option of the LP or if there was a dispensaries that were um, operating that weren't getting raided every day. Definitely. I think that's, yeah. that's terrible about the, the dispensaries being raided. I mean, a lot of yeah. times a patient gets comfortable going to a certain place to get their medicine. And a lot of times you're dealing with people that have uh, PTSD or, you know, things that can make them feel anxious. And then this kind of thing happens, and it's it's kind of a shame. It really is. Yeah, well, you found a dispensary that you like, staff that you've come to know and oftentimes become like family, and you find strains and types of medicine that, that work for you, and all of a sudden, poof, it's all gone. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes it takes people a lot to establish that comfortable feeling, especially where cannabis is concerned, because there is such a stigma on it. So, you know, a lot of times people don't feel comfortable going and talking to, um, you know, a stranger, but yet when they get a nice uh, rapport with someone and that's taken, I mean, that, that does damage to people and that's, that's uncalled for. Definitely. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Are are there many dispensaries in in your neighborhood, your town, or your your city? I'm not sure what type of a setting you I, live in. Yeah, there are quite a few here. Um, there's there's um, I live actually close to Portland, Oregon, just right in the outskirts of Portland, Oregon. So yeah, there's quite a few neighborhood dispensaries, but it took a while. Each county here was was different on the rules that, and how many you could have, um, how far apart they had to be from a school or from each other. So at first it was rocky, but now I've noticed it seems like um, we still have medical and recreational um, dispensaries that are working, you know, just fine, two and three of them on the same street. But, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of nice to have that because then you have your different choices of, of you know, your medicine. Oh, for sure. And, and um, the supply for all of the dispensaries, does that come from all of these growers that apply for the varying $4,000 licenses? Yes, exactly. That's exactly where all of it comes. And um, they do go through, I know that they have made um, the uh, testing on the products a little bit uh um, more, they're more vigilant about the testing and they've made them a little bit harder, which is good because you know now that you're kind of getting medicine that's been ran through a stricter screening process. Um, I know it has cost a lot of uh, the growers and the people, the small businesses, a lot of money, which kind of hurt them. Um, but I think it is important when you get reputable labs that are doing the work to uh, make sure that the product is safe for people. Well, uh, definitely. I mean, I, ironically, here in Canada, we've just had issues with a couple of the licensed producers who sold products to patients that had been treated with pesticides. Yeah, because like we're not even—they're not even required to have testing done. Wow, like, we're listening to what you guys go through down there for these people to get this license to to sell to the dispensaries 
Whereas, yeah, the, the um, licensed producers here weren't even being inspected by Health Canada. And, and yet, Janice, the, cry, the hue and cry here is because none of the dispensaries are technically legal, is that they're providing products that aren't tested, so therefore they're dangerous. <laughs> oh, that's why they're shutting them down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and legalization's coming in. So it looks like they're trying to get rid of the black market or that part of the market so they can put in their own. Oh, they're never going to get rid of the black market. That's never going to go away. It won't. I'm sorry. Someone's always going to have a cheaper price. I'm not saying that, you know, we couldn't improve that, but there there will always be a black market. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. Definitely, but it seems to me the approach that Oregon is taking that, that we just talked about would go a long ways toward helping the elimination of the black market. Yeah, it brings um, it bring everybody under the same umbrella, a $4,000 license. No, yeah, I agree with that. I do. I, I feel like Oregon is, they're really, they're really listening to what um, the cannabis patients and, and recreational users are saying here. Um, I, and I really do feel like we're on the right track with some things. Um, you know, I listening to what you guys have gone through, there's no testing. That is so scary to me. I mean, the amount of, of oil I take for it not to be tested is, um, that's a scary thought to me, what it could be doing to my body if it had all those pesticides. Wow. Well, this, I, uh, Deb, can you, I can't, I can't say the name, you know, the tongue twister of, of the chemical that was on the plants. You would. <laughs> 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 but when it's burned, it, when it's burned, it turns into um, some type of um, cyanide. I, uh, I, I do believe you're correct, Al, and for the life of me, I, I can't remember the it, name of the chemical either. John Percy should be here. Yeah. Um, because, because he is a, a customer of the licensed producer in New Brunswick. Organigram, Organigram that uh, have issued the recalls and, and one of the guilty parties uh, it involved in distributing this pesticide-laden cannabis. Um, yeah. And, and it causes all kinds of negative uh, health side effects and in in fact Health Canada were in the states last year and participated in a conference where all of that information was made readily available. Yeah. yeah. Wow. From an American toxicologist. Yeah. They couldn't believe that these people had it on their plants and should never be used in a plant that was being uh, smoked. That is just, that is so scary to me. Oh, and the thing is, it, it hasn't wasn't just like once. There's one report of it going on for a couple of years. Oh wow! Can you yeah. Imagine what those poor patients have gone through. So the, and workers. The, I mean, over a two-year period, that's a long time to be exposed to something. Workers in one of the facilities confirmed that. Uh, the directors of the facility were hiding the pesticides in the ceiling. Oh, wow. So if anybody, if anybody they were hiding bottles to come for an inspection that nobody would ever be aware that it was even there. Yeah. And now there's what, uh, yeah. three uh, class action lawsuits that are up against uh, those producers. Guys, are the patients, you know, t- take them back to court. Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame them because you never know. I mean, especially someone with a really sensitive illness, that could that could be a death sentence to them. Well, that draw that chemical, which uh, when it's burned and it ends ends up in your lungs and it right directly into your blood system. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm just looking for the uh, some of the exact. Well, this, and you know the. When, when you look the at people the average, doing it, they may not have been informed that this was the case with it, you know? Yeah. 
Um, reported system or, or symptoms have included weight loss, nausea, vomiting, throat irritation, and respiratory tract and irritation. Wow, see, someone that has lung issues or, you know, is susceptible to, to pneumonia or, you know, emphysema, that could yeah. exas exasperate the problem for them and make it worse. Yeah. One so, company, yeah, that's, that's not good. Yeah. One company had 21,000 customers. Wow. So that's, a lot of that's a lot of patients consuming something. Yeah, hydrogen, hydrogen you know, cyanide. That's what that's what the that's what the chemical turns into when it, once it's burned. Cyanide. That's cyanide. a serious poison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not something we all keep on our shelf at, at home, right? No, definitely not. No, no. Exactly. So, yeah, so they're going to find themselves in front of the courts again. But that, you know, that shows why, you know, the system you guys have for the p patients, you know, requiring all that testing is, is uh, you know, better than what we have. Now, all these comp companies, I believe, Deb, the, the two or three that got busted on this, um, I think they have mandatory testing for probably, I don't know how long, but. Well, it's it's mandatory, but I think it's also random mail, so that yeah. not every batch of medicine that's being released to patients is necessarily being tested. Um, I know Organigram was bragging to be organic up until up until the point that uh, their cannabis hit the fan, shall we say, and uh, they lost their their organic status. And I'm not sure when it comes to growing cannabis how long it would take to regain that. It's going to take a while. I would think so. Uh, I know that they have to, you know, obviously right through the whole process again. And then just trying to win back the customers to, so that they feel that they are consuming something organic and something that hasn't been sprayed. Yeah, yeah how do you trust someone that puts a totally yeah. organic label and then find out later that they're using stuff that, you know, is can be bad for you? That's going to take a lot of, work, you know, earning someone's trust back. Isn't it, though? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I promise I won't do that again, and I promise I won't hide it in the ceiling, and I promise, yeah. No, yeah. It, in my world, by then, it would have long been blown. And, right. Uh, how many... How many ceilings are the inspectors going to be looking at now? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> it should it should be on the checklist for sure. For sure. Oh yeah, for sure. That's right. I know. Like just the, since uh, they've made things stricter here, there's been a couple of products that they've taken off the shelf that they've that they have deemed are not good that people have been using and getting through the first. They, the uh, testing they used to do before they started tightening the belt, these were products that got through that testing, and now these are products that they're not allowed to use anymore, and there's a lot of growers that were saying they were organic that are scrambling now to actually learn how to do actual organic farming because they can't get through the testing anymore. So there's a lot of people that are having to go back to school here in Oregon to try to you know learn how to actually grow organically well <clears throat> more people who learn more people who learn how to grow organically better everybody will be that's right I think I think that you know a lot of people take shortcuts because they uh, most people are in it for the money um, but the ones that that you know actually took the time to learn about the plant and about soil and and how it how things grow um, those are the ones that are not suffering right now. They're the ones that are actually being able to grow product that's, you know, viable, clean medicine that can go into the dispensaries. As they see, as they say, feed the soil, and the soil will feed the plant. Right. Yes. Well, looks like uh, well, we've got about a minute to break. So, what do you think? Should we just go for a break now, and we'll come back afterwards and get into? Um, some of your medical use and how you consume and stuff like that. 
Janice? Yes, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll go for break. And uh, tonight's featured artist is Chief Greenbud, who's located down in the U.S., as our guest is as well. And we're going to hear some more of his song, A Friend With Weed Is A Friend Indeed. And then Deb and I will continue our conversation with Janice, who is in a legal state, and we are comparing our two programs. So you're listening to the Pace Radio Show here at lifestyleradio.net. You're listening to the Pace Radio Show. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. You'd be surprised how many folks smoke pot. I've known teachers, doctors, lawyers, hell, I even knew one state cop. When they burn their last ones down and their dealers can't be found, you know that they'll call on me because I'll share what I've Growing your own vegetables, flowers, or even medicinal plants can be a challenge without the right equipment and proper know-how. At BMA Hydroponics, not only are they your urban horticultural experts and suppliers, but their staff holds the customer's needs paramount to making a sale. Family-owned with decades of experience and knowledge, they offer free advice in person by phone or email. BMA Hydroponics wants to ensure you have the advice you need, which is why you'll find tips and tricks on different ways to grow, like WIC, Ebb and Flow, Drip, or Aeroponic System, as well as other helpful links at bmahydroponics.com. If you can't find what you're looking for, just let them know, and they'll do everything they can to get what you're looking for. At BMA Hydroponics, each staff member also possesses a federal exempt MMAR license, making their strong suit, empathy, experience, and dedication to their customers. Because when you know how to grow, you'll have results that make you proud. BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. Visit bmahydroponics.com. BMA offers cannabinoid testing. So if you want to prove you've got good medicine, head to BMA Hydroponics and prove it. Man, have you been to Canada's yet? Canada's. Campbellford's premier cannabis culture shop at 19 Bridge Street West. They've got bongs, oil rigs, grinders, and papers. Everything you need for consumption. They've got seeds, soil, nutrients, and dome trays, too. Everything you need for cultivation. Get top quality seeds from top suppliers like Canuck, Crop King, and wholesaler Nexus. Canna Days. They've got all kinds of awesome cannabis novelties, clothing, and apparel. I know, right? It's a lot more than just a bong shop. Interested in gaining legal access? Canna Days can help. They're a PACE information center. You know, people advocating cannabis education? Come by the shop and check it out. 19 Bridge Street West, Campbellford. Canna Days. Have your say without saying a word. Canadays.ca. Hi, this is Al Graham of the Pace Radio Show. Are you keeping pace, as in keeping people advocating cannabis education? If you're not, and you're a cannabis consumer, then why not? Others are working hard every day to help educate people about cannabis so you can enjoy your daily 420. Get involved and speak out. Be loud and proud so that you can keep pace. Tune into the Pace Radio Show every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to hear about people advocating cannabis education here on Lifestyle Radio. Canada, the time to act is now. These days, your customers are seeking variety. Increase your earning potential by expanding your inventory with CC Nexus, Canada's largest cannabis seed wholesaler. CC Nexus stocks over 60 reputable breeders, including Canuck seeds, with a wealth of auto flower, regular, feminized, and CBD strains. All first-time customers will receive a free pack of Canuck Seeds, plus a mug, t-shirt, and additional promotional materials. Add strains and increase your profit with CC Nexus, your Canadian-owned and operated wholesaler of cannabis seeds. Discreet, worldwide stealth shipping from Canada, supporting you locally. Call today, 1-844-843-7995, 1-844-843-7995, or visit us at ccnexus.global. I'll share my sack, I got your back, you do the same for me, don't you agree? That a friend with weed is a friend indeed. 
Yeah, friend. Hey, we're back we. and we're live as normal, as always. LifestyleRadio.net, Speaker Plus. Uh, you can catch your podcast at uh, afterwards. Uh, we're posted at Mixcloud, YouTube, uh, as well as other social media. Today we feature the music of uh, U.S. artist uh, Chief Greenbud and his uh, song "A Friend with Weed Is a Friend Indeed." I met the Chief. Yes, I did many years ago, back in 2010, during the Treating Yourself Expo. Oh, he was there to pick up an award for a song that was uh, picked as the song of the year for the um, marijuana, or the American Mar- Marijuana Music Awards. I got the name wrong, but it's close. Uh, and that song was "It's 4:20 Somewhere." Um, the guy has some great uh, country song parodies, and uh, actually, to tell you the truth, he's the only country artist that I actually listen to. So if uh, you, yeah, so if you enjoyed today's bumper song, you can catch more of it at chiefgreenbud.com. Yeah, that's right, Deb. He's, he's the only country music artist in my collection. Huh. Neat. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard of him, but tonight's the first time I've actually listened to him. Oh yeah, yeah. He's got uh, he's got some great ta- songs. I got two of his CDs, um, and I got some of his um, videos and stuff here uh, uh, bookmarked. Neat. I think I'll be uh, looking. Yeah, you him check up him on out. YouTube. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. And yeah. if I were to buy something, yeah, it would be my only country CD too. <laughs> 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 uh, I imagine where you're at, uh, you probably have some lots of country music down there, Janice. Yeah, we do, but I I'm one also that don't really own any country music, but I do like Mr. Green. But I love his music, and I have heard, uh, you know, a lot of people use his work for different things. So I really like that gentleman. He's great. Yes, he is, and, and uh, we had a fantastic time. Uh, great company and all that at the. The expo. I, well, Deb, you were at the expo. You didn't, didn't happen to run into him? Um, well, it wasn't 2010 when I was there, Al. I was at the last one. I um, believe 2014, was 13. it? Yeah, 13, yeah. Yeah, okay. 20, uh, yeah, 13, yeah. Time flies when you're sure. having fun. It sure does, <laughs> eh? <laughs> okay, um, so we want to switch gears here. Um and uh, get a little bit more on the personal side of Janice and her medical use of cannabis? Certainly. Yeah. yeah. I'll let you, I'll let you get rolling and I'll just <laughs> as normal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Stay um, in the background for a second. <laughs> Janice, perhaps I'll get you to start with uh, talking about talking about your your condition again and telling folks what it is because certainly it sounds like it's it's very rare it's something i'm not familiar with at all same here you know there's a lot of a lot of doctors aren't familiar with it it is kind of rare but i have noticed since i was diagnosed three years ago that it it is becoming more prevalent and there's now children that are actually being diagnosed with it and they don't know what causes it Interesting. Wow, well, don't know, eh? Wow. And they have you what? Uh, they have you on a pile of drugs, pharmaceutical drugs for this. Um, like yeah, what's they the, did. What's, the, um, what's that? It causes you to have really bad migraines, okay. and so they they had me on some pretty heavy um, pain medication, and then they had me on a pill called Diamox. And that one, it uh, your body doesn't filter it well, so it, it tends to shut your kidneys down, which is exactly what it did to me. Mm. Scary so you end up, So you end up with, uh, like, a liver uh, kidney disease? Yeah. So you get sick from your pills that are supposed to be making you better. Mm. Exactly. And, what and they you give you the pills. Pill. Sorry, you go Excuse ahead. Excuse me. They Go give ahead, you the pills because there's not there's not really anything that they can do for the condition besides the brain surgery. For the condition besides the brain surgery. And that sounds highly dangerous. It sure does. 
Well, yeah, they um they gave me less than a ten percent chance of survival. I've met with my illness that has had that brain surgery and had that little shunt that they put in there. It that they have had to go in and have a revision, in other words, have another surgery and have a new shunt put in, and they're it's happening at an alarming rate. One of the young ladies I work with, she's twenty five and she's had to have six surgeries. Oh, six brain surgeries. Six. Yes, because those, the little thing they put in there, that shunt, it breaks down. So they have to go in and replace it constantly. And what's what's this shunt doing? The shunt is a little tiny pump, and it, it, pumps, it pumps all the excess spinal fluid off your brain and down into your stomach. Mm. Oh. That doesn't sound good either. Wow. No. Is it, a, oh. is it a situation that once the shunt is in, that it becomes a lifetime commitment that you just can't let it deteriorate and head off in another direction with your health care? Well, once the, there, there's never been a patient until recently that has ever had the shunt taken out and refused to have another one put in. She's now using cannabis oil, just like me. Awesome. And she doesn't. Shit. She had the shunt taken out, and that's the twenty-five-year-old girl I was talking about that's had the six surgery. Yeah, and you haven't, and you've never had the surgery. No, I told them I, you know, it was less than a ten percent chance for me. Yeah. And so I started using the oil because I was in such pain; I was bedridden. And I started using the Rick Simpson oil just to be able to combat my migraines. And it, lo and behold, nobody realized it, but this cannabis oil started keeping the pressure down on its own. Nice. It started to show yeah. uh, benefits versus um, your other options. Oh. Exactly. I mean, I haven't had another headache since I started taking the oil. And I was someone that lived with migraines every day. And how long have you been taking the oil, Janice? It's been three years. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. yeah what, a, what a difference that must make in your day-to-day -day existence. It has made every, every difference. I mean, I went from someone that was completely bedridden I had given up. I I was laying there waiting to die. I had I had a seven year old daughter at the time. So finding this oil and being able to get up out of bed, I live a normal life like everybody else now. I mean, I still have my bad days at times, but you know, it's like one out of every thirty days I may have a really bad day. Where it used to be one in every thirty, I had a good day. So it has totally changed my life. So how did you discover the Rick Simpson oil? My my oldest daughter, her uh, her husband's dad was using it to treat his leukemia, and um, he he found out about it by the, the uh, this little girl named Brave Michaela, Michaela Comstock. She her yes. story. You know, she treat, she was treating cancer as well with it and went into remission in six days using the oil. That's right. I know of her. I'm sure Deb does too. Yes, yeah. I know. Her story is the one that saved my life. And, and just a side note, Janice, I've met Rick Simpson on a few occasions as well. Really? You know Rick Simpson? He, yes, yeah, yeah. He's from Nova Scotia in Canada, and that's yeah, where I'm from as well. That's so exciting. He's like one of my big heroes. So that, I, I'm sorry. I was just kind of thrown for a loop there. That's just that's really neat that you met him. Um, in, I'm I'm um, chair of a not for profit here in Nova Scotia that advocates for patients and and uh, we do lobbying and educational work as well and. Ten years ago, he came with a number of people that were featured in the Run from the Cure video. And mm -hmm. uh, we did 
we did the first public showing of the video and uh all of the patients who were in attendance got up and spoke so it was it was quite an afternoon for sure wow that's really neat what an honor well yeah it it was and uh interestingly enough we chatted about this occasion on uh, a local radio station the day before and when I arrived for for this meeting about it was at about 15 or 20 minutes before it was supposed to start the place was already packed and interestingly enough it was predominantly seniors mm, I'm not surprised nice. yeah 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 that's what I find so uh, apart from the Rick Simpson oil, do you consume cannabis in, in other forms as well? I do. I actually, because I take two grams of the oil and it makes me really sleepy, I do dab. I do do concentrates and I do dab oil um, because if I, if I dab a sativa, it helps me get up and get my housework done and get you know things done I need for my daughter. So, and then I occasionally will smoke some flour um, to relax myself at night. And I, you know, I use it in all different ways. I do, I make a salve that I used for my aches and pains. Um, I'm finding that it works well with everything. If you juice it, it works really well for a probiotic for your stomach. So, you know, I'm finding it to, to work well in all different ways. And do you use predominantly Charlotte's Web or high CBD strains? No, actually for my illness, it takes kind of a level balance of both CBD and THC. So I found the best strain for my illness is a Blackberry Kush. That sounds tasty. So I try to, yeah, I try to, to, to go towards a Blackberry Kush or a Vanilla Kush. Or you know a Hawaiian snow, those strings seem to work the best for my illness, um, and also a, a catatonic for added with the oil for the higher CBD yes. is a great combination. Nice, nice. You have good recommendations. The, oh, uh, good. I'm hoping there's an intracranial hypertension hypertension patient listening, and that I can get it through to them. That they don't need to have that surgery. Yeah, or, exactly. or maybe like you, they have a, a an uncle at home who has the same condition that they can then offer the similar advice to. Yeah. Like you like you learning about it through your son in law, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and naming I feel uh, like and knowing what strains help you further helps a person like i got uh, i got an email there the other day somebody was dealing with a medical condition and they want to know what strain should they grow because they had gotten their license and mm -hmm. like, it, you can only do tell them so much but uh, you know i sent them on a path to find what would work for them but you know there isn't that magic book all the time where you can get it or get the information because it does affect people people differently it's true. Everybody's body works different. So something that works perfect for me, it may, you know, they may have to adjust and maybe a different strain for them. Yeah. Um, it yeah, just depends. Yeah. You got to kind of mess with it. I've taken so many different types of oils and strains of oil to try to narrow it down. I feel like I'm my own little guinea pig. You know, I'm, I'm doing all this research on myself, but I am documenting my research so that I have it for, you know, future. Good. That's a very useful thing to do. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> yeah, I feel that way. It'll if there any you... questions come up, or you know, um, even with the lawmakers, you know, I took my medical records to show them what I'm dealing with, and um, I just feel like having that kind of shows them that hey, I'm I'm doing my own research. Let's let's put an olive branch out, and maybe you put forth a little bit of money. And start doing some research as well. Well, definitely, it's 
the time for research is is long past. I mean, yeah. it should have been done years ago, but thanks to prohibition, it's constantly been brushed aside, and we've pretty much experienced the same thing in in Canada as far as a lack of research and. Yes. Yeah that our doctors always fall back on that, that they can't recommend anybody use cannabis because, God forbid, there's no research. Yeah. Right. Well, so, I think some of our licensed producers are doing a few trial things, but, you know, like you say, there's, there's, there's a lot, like, I, I can send people to lots of research, but, yeah, they want the research done their way. Well, yeah, exactly. Have, either the made in USA or the made in Canada stamp on on the research before our countries will even look at it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it's not gonna but get yet a US they're not willing to do it. it. <laughs> yeah. It's it's uh you know, prohibition laws, it was it's crazy. And you know, there's that's why there's so much anecdotal evidence out there, people speaking up like yourself. Yeah. You know? I feel like that's what's going to be the change is people speaking up and educating. You know, it, it comes hard to tell people they can't have a certain medicine when their life depends on it. And there's so many people now that are realizing that their illness, they depend on cannabis, that it's important for us to start looking at it more, you know, seriously as viable medicine. And I'm glad that, that we're doing shows like yours that are educating people you don't know how much I appreciate you guys for what you do. Well, thank you very much. Well, and, and thank you for being a part of it all tonight. It, yes. It's, it's been uh, really informative and educational for us as well. I feel like I've done a couple of other radio shows, and I just feel like you guys are really on point with what's really going on and the questions that need to be asked and the things that need to be talked about. And you, you take it seriously as a medicine. And that for that, I just, I, I'm hoping that we get more people like you guys that, that have a forum like this for us to speak out in. And I just really, really appreciate it. Well, again, thank you. Thank you for the, your kind words. It's, um, yeah, it, it's, you know, we don't, you know, sometimes we have some fun, but some people say we're, we do get some serious. We are serious, and, and we want to make sure that um, people get the truth, you know, get get the word out there. It's, it's I don't know, it's probably something Deb and I have been doing since the uh, start of our advocacy work is, is getting more knowledge out there, and, and Deb's been with the radio show since day one. Well, I feel like I'm not going to be missing an episode of your show because just talking with you guys tonight, I've learned a lot that I had no idea was going on in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say likewise for us in Oregon too, eh, Deb? Well, I found it completely fascinating, Janice, to hear just what is going on in, in Oregon. And in, in many ways, I wish that Canada would follow the model of, of allowing what we refer to as, as the craft industry here here in Canada that would allow growers to do the very thing that you speak of, growing 24 plants probably at home, but producing pe medicine for people who desperately need it and medicine for dispensaries. That's yeah, exactly. That's, that's the first thing I yeah. thought of, Deb. And I feel and like I, we I, could learn a lot from the model you guys have on having your doctor be the one that writes the prescription on how much you get. I feel like there's good trades back and forth between us. <laughs> well, I, I, in listening to you speak and, and being more than familiar what's going on with what's going on in our country, it seems to me that if we married up components of the two of them, we'd have a fairly dynamic uh, program. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it would be like the perfect program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think between us, uh, we, we sure could come up with a program that would make a lot of patients happen. Yeah. That's for sure. Save a lot of lives, too. That's right. 
save a lot of lives, so, save a lot of money in health care costs. Like yeah, here in Canada, yeah. uh, like, you know, Ontario here, it's all covered through the government. It's paid. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you go to the hospital, the bill is paid by the government. Now, I, don't I know, wanted to you, ask about that. So that's true. I mean, I you know, it's kind of like in... in we're down here in the United States. A lot of people talk about you guys getting free um, health care, and really, what's that like? Do you get good health care that it's free, or I, I can speak for myself. I'm sure there's there's always a long list of complaints, but there's probably a long list of people who who would say it's been great for them as well. But yeah, it's it's covered through taxes and. Uh, Money collected from businesses, as far as the OHIP end of it all, which is for Ontario here. Um, if I need an MRI, my specialist orders an MRI. I usually get that within uh, a week to two weeks, and I go in, get it, and I come home. It doesn't cost me a cent. Wow. Uh, I, I'm impressed because in Nova Scotia, the wait time for something like an MRI would certainly be much longer. Oh yeah, uh, we have really long wait times for uh, a lot of services. Mind you, it it's free, but there there are wait times and there's there are physician shortages, which yeah. probably hmm. accounts for the wait times, right? Yeah, we I have know, the physician shortages here too. At one point, uh, when the federal government changed the program and you needed to have a specialist to sign your paperwork in order to be considered legal by the federal government, there was something like a 21-month wait list at our our pain management clinic. Wow, that was for the Section 56. Uh, No, that was for the MMAR. Oh, you needed two signatures? Um, uh no. no just the one if if you were it was oh good lord it was convoluted yeah you i know eh? <laughs> be dead in a year your doctor could sign for you but if if your life was somewhat more hopeful and your expiration date was longer than a year as far as your doctor was concerned you needed to have a specialist if you had a, a list of certain conditions, you only needed one specialist signature. But if, if 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 it was one of any other condition, you needed to have two specialists signed. Sign. It was messed up. It, it was one of the the dark day periods for the program. Shall it we was. say? Yes, it was. Okay, ladies, um, the clock is ticking, and we're down to the final few minutes. Um, so. What I'm basically going to check with Janice here is whether you have a shout out or something along that line uh, to a person, place, or thing that you'd like to mention. Yeah, I would. I would like to do a shout out actually to Dave and Stephanie Gosser at Mountain Valley Farm um, for everything that they're doing in the totally organic farming Um and the amount of love that they put into their medicine for their patients. So I just wanted to give them a shout out. And also Mother Jane's Body Products uh, for giving me a vision to work on. So thank you. Also Mother Jane's Body Products uh, for giving me a vision to work on. So thank you. Um, i just you very much. like to put out there that uh, Maritimers Unite for Medical Marijuana Society's web pages revamped we still have some work to do here and there but check out www.mumm.ca for our new and revised look so everybody look up mum on online (laughs) yes mum all righty um let's see just i'll be back next week uh, and Kim will be joining me I believe our guest is Dr. Price I believe that's who our guest is and um, just to remind yeah yeah I don't, you, know, you would know of him would you not um, Deb I uh, yes I'm familiar yeah, with yeah, Dr. Price yeah yeah. yeah yeah he's on next week um, and uh, just to let you know that you can find Pace on Twitter at 
Pace Radio, and you can also like us on Facebook, and we're also on Instagram. Just so you know, I sent out a picture tonight on Instagram before the show, about the show. And uh, our thank you tonight go to our sponsors, the friendly folks at BMA Hydroponics, who are located in Belleville, Ontario, at uh, bmahydroponics.com. Also, thank yous to CC Nexus, uh, who are Canada's largest cannabis wholesaler, and they are found at ccnexus.global. Always a big thank you to the man behind the baggie, Al Rapp of Lifestyle Radio. Dot net and uh, to you, Janice. Big thank you to you for coming on the program and sharing your story with our listeners. We really appreciate that. Thank yes, you. It's been great getting to know you, Janice. Yes. Yes, it's been great getting to know you guys, and you guys are wonderful. I really, really had a great time. Thank you. We're gonna have to have you back on. That's for sure. Okay, that so, sounds good. Give us an up- definitely. Yeah, give us an update on uh, what's going on down there and. And share more of your story, that's for sure. Okay, I sure will do that. Yeah, and I always like to throw a thank you, thank you out to my joint host, and tonight that was Debbie Stoltz-Giffen. So thank you to you, Deb, for being part of the program. Always my pleasure, Al. Yeah. And I can never say goodbye without thanking our listeners for tuning in the program. Thank you for doing so. Thank you, and good night. Good night. So what are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? I'm trying to get on this Lifestyle Radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's alright. Oh, wait, I might have it.